morning from Washington, D.C., and good evening to our friends in Seoul. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our annual Atlantic Council East Asia Foundation Strategic Dialogue. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. What we've learned uh, since mid-March of the Atlantic Council is there is geographic distance, but there doesn't necessarily need to be social distance. And we're trying to bridge that divide uh, virtually as much as we can. And we're just delighted uh, to have our colleagues at the A East Asia Foundation with us for this third year uh, uh, that the Atlantic Council's Asia Security Initiative housed within the Scowcroft uh, Center for Strategy and Security and the East Asia Foundation are holding this strategic dialogue. Um, each year, we are honored to uh, bring together a high level of lawmakers, officials, and experts who will help us gain a deeper understanding and provide concrete, actionable policy recommendations for the most pressing issues facing the US ROK Alliance and Economic Partnership. Our mission is shaping the global future together with allies. And what could do that more effectively than this sort of meeting? As we look ahead just a week from today to the US presidential election, this is an especially critical time for the US ROK Alliance. In the era of COVID-19, the rules-based international system is facing a range of evolving challenges, including uh, tensions and growing tensions in US-China relations, further developments in North Korea's uh, strategic weapons program, and enduring questions about the geopolitical and geoeconomic conditions of a post-pandemic world. To shed light on a possible way forward through these difficult times, we've brought together officials, lawmakers, and experts from the United States and the Republic of Korea uh, to discuss the future of our alliance and economic partnership. Uh, South Korea has been a linchpin ally of the United States for almost 70 years now. It has always been a reliable partner for our efforts and to, uh, uh, in common cause, to maintain peace and stability in the region and beyond. It has been a major beneficiary and contributor to the rules-based international system. We have no doubt in our minds that Korea will continue to play a crucial role in this critical period of strategic uncertainty. Uh, and we deeply value these opportunities for direct dialogue with our friends from South Korea. It is precisely why we have gathered here today from Washington to Seoul, despite the ongoing pandemic, for this virtual edition of the Strategic Dialogue. We here at the Atlantic Council believe that public dialogues are an important channel for important uh, influential stakeholders to bridge any gaps and understanding that may exist to develop a vision for how our nations can work together to face the uncertain global and economic environment together, integrating uh, our allies and partners' voices. Uh, this is an integral part of the Asia Security Initiative's mission at the Atlantic Council, alongside promoting forward-looking strategies and solutions for the Indo-Pacific region's most pressing issues in light of China's continued rise. Uh, I look forward to the discussions today. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers. Uh, finally, I just want to remind everyone that today's event is open to the public and on the record. Feel free to submit questions you have via Zoom in the Q&A function or on Twitter using at Atlantic Council. So at, at, at sorry, sorry, at AC Scowcroft, uh, at AC Scowcroft. And you can put your questions into Twitter or Facebook. Uh, for those of you who don't speak uh, Korean or English, uh, there is a interpretation button at the bottom of Zoom that you can see. Uh, that comes up as interpretation, and then you can click on it and change it to English or Korean. Before I hand over to Minister Kim Sung Hwan, my, uh, my uh, counterpart at the East Asia Foundation, I just want to whet your interest a little bit for the first uh, two panels of the morning. We're going to have two uh, Korean lawmakers, uh, His Excellency Kim uh, Han Jung and His Excellency uh, Park Chin. Uh, uh, 
and we're going to have uh, the uh, congressman from the third district of Florida, uh, uh, Congressman Ted Yoho, and then uh, also uh, Mark Knapper, the deputy assistant secretary for Korea and Japan, and they'll be moderated by Ms. Kylie Atwood. In the second session, we'll have Barry Pavel, the senior vice president director of Scowcroft Center, uh, in conversation with Chung and Moon. Uh, Dr. Chang and Moon, the special advisor for the president for unification and national security affairs, who's been a regular of these gatherings. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Minister uh, Kim Sung Wan. Minister Kim is a career diplomat and served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of the Republic of Korea from October 2010 to March uh, 2013. With a career, uh, with a uh, remarkable career spanning 36 years, he held a number of uh, his country's senior diplomatic posts, including senior secretary to the president for foreign affairs and national security and vice minister of foreign affairs and trade. He was the ROK's ambassador to Austria and permanent representative to international organizations in, in, in Vienna and the ROK's ambassador to Uzbekistan. In addition to a number of prestigious positions, Minister Kim is a distinguished professor at the Hanyang University and chairman of the East Asia Foundation, uh, with whom we have proudly partnered for this uh, third event. Minister Kim, let me turn the virtual stage to you. Thank you, Fred. Good morning colleagues, friends, and ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to have the third strategic dialogue between Atlantic Council and East Asia Foundation. Uh, with the US presidential election just a week away, not only American voters, but all Korean general public's eyes are also on the outcome of US presidential election. At this critical moment, I'm very much excited to have this strategic dialogue. Although we do not have face-to-face -face meeting due to COVID-19, today's online seminar will give us a valuable opportunity to discuss the future of our alliance in the context of a US-China strategic competition. On behalf of East Asia Foundation, I sincerely welcome all of you and wish to express my thanks to all the participants who have made this online seminar possible during this time of difficulties. Taking this opportunity, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to President Frederick Kemp and Vice President Barry Pavel of Atlantic Council for their efforts to make this strategic dialogue more rewarding and fruitful. I wish to express my special thanks to the Honorable Ted Yoho, a member of the US House Representative the Honorable Mark Nepper, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asia and Pacific of the State Department, and the Honorable Park Jin and the Honorable Kim Han Jung, uh, members of the Korean National Assembly, who gladly joined today's seminar despite their busy schedule in this time of politics. I expect that the insightful presentation will show us how Korea-US alliance will evolve in the coming years. I also wish to express my thanks to today's speakers, Professor Moon Jong-in, Special Advisor to the President for Unification and National Security Affairs, Dr. Robert Donor, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Treasury Department, Dr. Oh mi Yun, Director of Asia Security Initiative of Atlantic Council, and Dr. Park Tae-ho, former Minister of Trade of Republic of Korea, and Professor Lee Sung-ju of Chungang University. Lastly, but not the least, I would like to thank Mrs. Kylie Atwood, National Security Reporter of CNN, and Mr. Josh Lipsky, Director of Policy and Programs in the Atlantic Council, for their moderating first and second session, respectively. All these politicians, scholars, and experts will shed a light on the future path of security alliance and economic partnership between our two countries. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War, which became the starting point of a security alliance between Korea and the United States. 
It is gratifying to note that for the last seven decades, our alliance has evolved into the mutually beneficial partnership based on security imperatives, economic interests, and shared values, overcoming many challenges together. Primary among these is the North Korean nuclear issue. As you remember, thanks to the efforts of both Korean and the U.S. governments, President Trump and the Chairman Kim Jong-un had their first summit in Singapore in June 2018 and agreed to resolve key issues including denuclearization of North Korea and the establishment of peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. However, denuclearization talks between the U.S. and North Korea remain stuck in stalemate after the second summit between President Trump and Chairman Kim ended without agreement last February in Hanoi. In the area of establishing peace regime on the Korean Peninsula, Korean government has been making strenuous efforts to have a dialogue on end of war declaration. However, North Korea has not yet made any response to Korean government's initiative. It is disappointing to see that situation on the Korean Peninsula has not been improved quickly as we expected despite efforts of both Korean and the U.S. governments. Only consolation is that North Korean leader had some warm words for South Korea and anti-U.S. slogans usually visible during the North Korean military parade had not been prominently displayed during the military parade commemorating the 75th anniversary of the foundation of the North Korean Workers' Party two weeks ago. In the past, North Korea conducted new weapons tests at an early stage of a new U.S. presidential term as an attempt to gain leverage in the negotiations with the United States. I hope <clears throat> this would not be the case this time and the North Korea's soft attitude towards South Korea and the United States seen in the Chairman Kim's speech would lead to the dialogue between South and North Korea and U.S. and North Korea after the U.S. presidential election. The value of the U.S. ROK alliance is not limited to the pursuit of collective security. Interdependent and closely connected economic partnership between the two countries has been another crucial pillar of strengthening our alliance. In the years after the Korean War, Korea could hardly have been called an economic partner of the United States. However, as Korea has grown economically, the U.S.-Korea relationship has grown as well, and the free trade agreement between the two countries entered into force in 2010. Today, Korea is America's seventh largest trading partner, exchanging everything from cars to high-tech equipment. Thanks to these multidimensional ties between our two countries, American general public's support for the U.S.-Korea alliance and the South Korea's reputation in the United States has been steadily increased. According to the recent survey by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, 77% of respondents said they want to continue to build up strong relations with uh, traditional allies like South Korea, and 58% of respondents favored U.S. troops defending South Korea. Korea's reputation reached an all-time high in the United States thanks to K-pop and Korea's effective handling of coronavirus pandemic. In recent years, U.S.-China trade war has become the most influential and unpredictable variable in the U.S.-Korea economic partnership. How to harmonize our security alliance with the U.S. and the relationship with China, Korea's number one trading partner, becomes Korea's priority task. I sincerely hope that today's dialogue would provide the wisdom on how to cope with the impending challenges in the U.S. ROK alliance and economic cooperation in a new era of U.S.-China strategic competition. Before I conclude my remarks, let me take a few moments to introduce East Asia Foundation. East Asia Foundation was founded in 2005 with a generous funding from Hyundai Motor Company with a view to broaden knowledge networks. We have maintained exchanges with a number of institutions and universities in the United States, Japan, and China, 
And we also publish a quarterly English journal, Global Asia. Once again, I wish to thank all of you for participating in the third strategic dialogue between Atlantic Council and East Asia Foundation, and particularly those who laboriously prepared today's meeting. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you uh, so much for those welcoming remarks this morning. My name is Kylie Atwood. I am a CNN national security correspondent. Um, I have had uh, the pleasure and the honor of traveling to South Korea a number of times over the last few years, and I'm um, very much looking forward to this conversation today as it comes at such a pivotal moment um, in terms of the future of the U.S. and South Korean Alliance. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. This again is an event hosted by the Atlantic Council and the East Asia Foundation. Um, particularly uh, great thanks to those who helped put this together. We all know how challenging it can be um, in terms of technology and the days and age in which we live. So thank you for that. Um, another reminder is that um, for those of you joining us from Korea or from the US, you're going to want to look at your Zoom and make sure that your interpretation is set to the right language. Um, the folks putting this on helped me do that this morning. It's pretty easy. Just look for the button that says interpretation and click the language uh, in which you would like to hear the remarks today. So I'm going to open um, by introducing our panel today. Um, we have four uh, incredibly uh, talented and insightful officials who are going to be joining us, and then I'm going to turn it over to them um, for some opening remarks. So let's start off with His Excellent Excellency Heijon Kim, who is a South Korean lawmaker. Um, He's a member of the 21st National Assembly of the Republic of Korea. He's serving in his second term in the National Assembly. He began his career as a press secretary for Kim Dae-jong, chairman of the Democratic Party of Korea. He served as an advisor to President Kim Dae-jong of the ROK. And during his time in office, he accompanied President Kim to the historical 2000 Inter-Korea Summit. He is currently a member of the Public Administration and Security Committee and the Special Committee on Inter-Korean Economic Development of the ROK National Assembly. He has been recognized for his expertise in inter-Korean relations and foreign affairs. And he's also researched North Korean and U.S. relations as a visiting scholar at the Cornell University East Asia Program and taught international relations at Yonsei University. Mr. Kim was a senior advisor to presidential candidate Moon Jae-in during the 2012 presidential elections. He's also played an active role in Moon's election in 2017 as the deputy head of strategic headquarters within the Democratic Party's Central Election Campaign Committee. And as a member of the ruling party on the National Assembly, he regularly advises the Moon administration's policies on North-South Korean relations and the South Korean-U.S. relations as well. And in 2018, he traveled to Pyongyang as the executive execution committee chairperson of the Korean Council for Reconciliation and Cooperation to facilitate non-government exchange between the North and the South. So, Mr. Kim, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to turn over to one of our American uh, colleagues this morning, uh, the Honorable Mark Knapper. He is well known at the State Department. I can tell you that um, from spending a lot of time in that building. He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Korea and Japan in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. He's a senior, mem senior Foreign Service member at State Department. He served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary um, for Korea and Japan since 2018. Before that position, he was in Seoul as Charge Aide Affairs from 2017 to 2018 and Deputy, Mich Deputy Chief of Mission from 2015 to 2016. Um, he has had a number of other uh, assignments, including Director for India Affairs, Director for Japanese Affairs, multiple postings in Tokyo, Seoul, Hanoi, and Baghdad. He's twice worked in the DRC, um, 
once in 1997 as a State Department representative to the spent fuel team at the Yongbyong nuclear facility, and again in 2000 as part of the advance team for then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright's visit to Pyongyang. Um, we all remember that well as a potential hopeful moment, um, but look where we are today. Napper is a recipient of a number of awards at the State Department, including the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, the nation's highest diplomatic honor. He's also received the Linguist of the Year Award, three Superior Honor Awards. He's summa cum laude graduate from Princeton. He's also studied at the University of Tokyo. Um, he partook in Middlebury College's intensive Japanese program. That's my alma mater, Mark, so I look forward to discussing that one day with you. And he was also at the Army War College, MIT. Um, he's done a lot of things. He speaks Korean, uh, Japanese, and Vietnamese. So, Mark, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I want to turn back um, to a panelist from South Korea, His Excellency Jin Park. Um, Dr. Jin Park is a member of the 21st National Assembly of the Republic of Korea, serving for his fourth term in the National Assembly, representing <laughs> the Gangnam 2nd District. He's currently serving as a senior member of the Foreign Affairs and Unification Committee. Dr. Park served as a National Assemblyman for 10 years, representing the Central Jungyo District in Seoul. And while in politics, he served as the Chairman of Foreign Affairs, Trade, and National Unification Committee of the National Assembly from 2008 to 2010. Um, he's worked on a tremendous number of legislative uh, efforts, particularly in that role. And outside of politics, Dr. Park led the Asia Future Institute. That's an independent policy think tank established in 2013 and designed to conduct research on economic, political, and strategic issues in Asia to promote Korea's role in the Asia Pacific region. Um, he's also served as the chairman of the Korea American Korea Association, which was created in 1963. Um, and he graduated from the College of Law at Seoul National University. He's been to the Kennedy School of Government, the New York University Law School, and received a doctorate degree in politics from St. Anthony's College, Oxford University. He's a registered member of the New York Bar since 2001 and a regular member of the Seoul Forum for International Affairs. He also taught as an endowed chair professor at the Graduate School of International and Area Studies of Hankook University of Foreign Studies. Um, he previously led the Korean Britain Society, the executive president, and with great affection for the sea, he served in the Korean military as a Navy officer. So we have lots to talk about today. Um, thank you for joining us, Dr. Park. And last but definitely not least, uh, we have Congressman Ted Yoho. Um, most importantly, he is a member of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs and a ranking member of the Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific. He is well versed in the issues that we will be discussing today. Um, his approach to government is guided by constitutional principles, limited government, fiscal conservatism, personal responsibility, and free enterprise. Um, Prior to serving in Congress, and I want to point out that he's now in his fourth term in Congress, um, Congressman Yoho was a small business owner who operated several large animal veterinary practices for 30 years. And during his career, he established a reputation of accountability and service. Born in Minnesota, he moved to South Florida, where he and his wife um, met in the fourth grade, and, he, and they married at age 19. And after completing his degree at Broward Co Community College, Congressman Yoho and his wife moved to Gainesville. He enrolled in the University of Florida, graduated in 1983 with bachelor's in animal science and doctor of veterinary medicine, while Carolyn had created her own very successful court reporting um, agencies. So thank you, everyone. Um, I 
I'm sorry that that took a while, but we had a lot to get through. And I do want to open it to the four of you um, to see if you have any remarks before we open into um, some dialogue and some questions from me and folks who have tuned in. Um, so why don't we, you know, go in the order uh, that I just introduced folks in, um, and we could start with uh, uh, His Honorable Heijan Kim. Uh, yeah, 반갑습니다. Kim Han Jung. Yes, thank you. Great to meet you all. My name is Han Jung Kim. I would like to first of all thank the Atlantic Council and the East Asia Foundation. Thank you very much for organizing today's dialogue. Now, the national interest of Korea and the U.S. now for us to uh, find the alignment in East Asia. So I do hope they will be able to have a productive discussion regarding that. Now, many experts say that the world is going to be different before and after COVID-19. But I do believe that the when it comes to security, then the essentially it is not going to change because there is the persistent threat of North Korea and also the US-China tension. So there is the tension and confrontation rising rather than peace and dialogue. And also the US-China tension is causing some, let's say, awkward and also discomfort to the surrounding countries. And then also in the post-pandemic world, what we need is more cooperation, wiser cooperation, and more refined cooperation. What we need is more coordination. So development and also a distribution of vaccine, that's also where we need coordination and cooperation. And also we need to have coordinated response against the global issues. And I do hope that we can recover human and trade exchanges and also joint response against climate change. That's also where we need cooperation and coordination. But then in the post-COVID-19 world, we must make sure that it is not going to be bigger than neighbor in order to overcome the pandemic and also for the international cooperation to overcome COVID-19. We need the U.S. leadership. We also need U.S.-China cooperation. Now, Korea was able to effectively and rapidly respond against COVID-19 so much so that it is uh, touted as one of the successful cases. And we will try harder to contribute to international cooperation. And we will also try to share our experience and resources with the international community. And we will also work harder regarding the North Korean nuclear issue, which must be resolved in a peaceful and diplomatic manner. North Korea right now is a bit passive, but then now in Singapore in 2018, and then also the Inter-Korea Joint Declaration, also the Hanoi Summit in 2019. Of, although the outcome was limited, I do believe that it was a meaningful step, a meaningful progress. And we must all remember that peace on the Korean Peninsula will be beneficial for both the US and Korean interests. No matter who is reelected in the November US uh, presidential election, I do hope that the peace process on the Korean Peninsula can be maintained and accelerated. And fortunately, both candidates, Biden and uh, Trump, are saying that they will have a dialogue with Kim Jong-un. Now, there must be no nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. And North Korea aspires for regime survival and also security. But so they have not uh, hidden this. But then for them, they believe that the only leverage that they have against the US is the nuclear weapons and missiles. And that is why they cannot let them go. And our strategic approach should be that uh, we need to create the kind of environment so that North Korea will be induced to change their mindset. And the kind of approach where it says that unless there is denuclearization, nothing will get started. This is not realistic because denuclearization is the goal. It's the end. And I believe that we need to come up with the and also discuss the kind of approach that will achieve this. Now, the Korean War stopped in 1953, but the truce regime still continues. And this is not normal because we are still under truce, not end of war. So it is time for us to declare the end of war. 
Korea, US, China all acknowledge the justification. North Korea has no justification to say no to this. And I believe that the end of war declaration will also be a catalyst toward denuclearization of North Korea. And North Korea, we understand, wishes to have normal ties with the US. And also at the end of the Clinton administration in 2000, uh, the US and North Korea went very close to normalizing ties is something that we must remember. Now, Korea hopes that the USRK alliance will be able to play a positive role in advancing peace on the Korean Peninsula. US ROC alliance has been instrumental in deterring the military actions of North Korea and also military expansion by China. And we see that there has also been a very wise response recently, for example, restraining the military drills and also a discussion of the transfer of OPCON. So it is important that the two countries continue to maintain cooperation. Now, the world's biggest single uh, military base is the Camp Humphreys. And this is only about 800 miles away from Beijing. So it is facing China. And also the THAAD system, when this was deployed in Songju of Korea, China highly resented this and Korea came under a tough spot. Now, China, as we have emphasized several times, is the number one trading partner to Korea. Korea must maintain good relations with the neighboring countries and also especially conflicts with China would spell you know, trouble for Korea. Now, also, it is true that there are some disagreements between the two countries regarding defense cost sharing, but Korea last year alone bore about $1 billion worth of defense costs. So this is by no means free riding. So if we can maintain the principles of mutual respect and fair share, then I do believe that the negotiations over the defense cost sharing will come to good fruition. Now, some even talk of the withdrawal of the USFK, but I do not believe that that serves the US interests. The size of the USFK could be flexibly adjusted. And the Korean government will undertake actions and make preparation to make sure that any changes to the USFK will not cause instability on the Korean Peninsula or the regional security. The Democratic okay, Party's um, leader Kim, I'm gonna has have to, recently uh, uh, set sorry. up the Korean Peninsula TF. Uh, I'm going to have to wrap you there so that we allow everyone uh, to give remarks and so that we can dive into some discussion. I'm sure you have more points that you'll be able to make um, as we continue this conversation. So thank you uh, for those remarks. Really interesting. Um, a lot of things we can expand upon. And I want to turn it over um, to Mark Knapper, um, Deputy Assistant Secretary. Mark, are you ready for some remarks? Sure. Thanks very much, Kylie. I appreciate your introduction earlier, um, and I appreciate the invitation today from both the Atlantic Council and the East Asia Foundation. It's a great pleasure to be here and see old friends, uh, and especially uh, former minister Kim sung Hwan. I'm actually going to end up echoing, I think, a lot of the, the points uh, he made, uh, just about our alliance with, with South Korea and how it's, um, how it's evolved over the years. When I first started working on Korean issues back in the early 90s, uh, this was a relationship between the U.S. and the Republic of Korea that was very uh, focused on uh, the peninsula. This was a relationship that was very focused on our sec security uh, aspects of our relationship, clearly focused on deterring uh, the North Korean threat and, and heaven forbid, uh, defending against a, a potential North Korean attack. But just in the uh, you know 27 years or so that uh, I've, I've been uh, working on Korea, um, it's just been amazing how significantly our alliance, our relationship has broadened, uh, to use the words that uh, Minister Kim Jong Hwan used earlier, how this relationship over second decades has, seven decades has evolved. It's grown from a very uh, specifically uh, security focused relationship to one that I think, you know, spans the full breadth of virtually every aspect of human activity, of human endeavor from uh, security, of course, but trade and investment, uh, science and technology cooperation, people-to-people -people ties, cultural exchanges, education exchanges, 
um, and even geographically, it's it's spread from a relationship focused on the peninsula to a relationship now in which, uh, as allies, we are cooperating globally. Uh, we are cooperating uh, increasingly in Southeast Asia, for example, taking President Moon's uh, what's known as the New Southern Policy and figuring out how does this New Southern Policy uh, overlap with and complement uh, the United States' own, the Trump administration's own Indo-Pacific strategy. So looking at ways that the U.S. and, and South Korea can leverage our strengths uh, in places like Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, the Pacific Islands, but also in areas like cybersecurity, counterterrorism, uh, environmental protection, uh, protecting uh, fish, fishing stocks in, in the Pacific Ocean, and on and on. And so I'm very proud of the growth that this relationship has made uh, just in the almost three decades I've been working on it. And I think it really is a function of, of uh, our two countries' ability um, to communicate well with each other. I think it's a function of our two countries' shared uh, values, uh, shared commitment to democracy, shared commitment to basic human rights, religious freedom, freedom of assembly. Um, and I'm very confident this is a relationship that will continue to evolve uh, to meet challenges, the challenges that are out there. And I think, you know, most recently, of course, we've seen uh, with, with COVID-19, how our two countries uh, stepped up and worked very well together um, uh, to, to coordinate, to cooperate, uh, continue to work together on things like vaccines, things like therapeutics, uh, continue to work together to ensure that critical uh, international travel uh, was uninterrupted. We worked together to repatriate our citizens who uh, in the early days, uh, the, you know, the global shutdown, we're stuck in, in various countries around the world. And I think significantly, uh, we were able to do this kind of health cooperation because of the, the muscle memory, so to speak, that we, we had from, from years past in which, particularly in the area of health cooperation, we worked very well together, uh, whether it was on the Ebola uh, crisis in West Africa in 2014, whether it was the uh, Middle East respiratory syndrome outbreak in Korea in 2015. These were both occasions in which our CDC, our health experts, were able to get together and, and it built a foundation for the cooperation in COVID that we're enjoying right now. And so uh, we, look at, we look to Korea as an exemplar. Uh, we look to Korea as a model for how to take on this pandemic. Uh, Korea did it in an open and transparent way based on its democratic values. Uh, you know, individuals weren't rounded up and, and, and forced to stay in their homes under lock and key. I mean, it was done in a, in a way that uh, respected Korea's democratic values and openness and transparency, and also relied really on Korea's uh, high-tech infrastructure. And so really a model for the world, uh, an exemplar for the world, and um, you know, very proud to count Korea among our best uh, friends, allies, and uh, partners. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay, back to the other side of the world. Um, Dr. Park, a few remarks from you, please. Well, thank you. Um, well, I think that uh, Korea-US alliance has come to a very critical juncture uh, because of four reasons. Uh, first is the pandemic crisis. Uh, this challenge requires not just one country's efforts, but a combined uh, efforts uh, by many countries uh, to overcome this crisis. Uh, Korea, uh, the situation in Korea is relatively under control, but uh, we are concerned here to see that uh, you have almost 70,000 uh, infections almost every day. And I think that uh, through the joint development of vaccines and taking preventive measures and pursuing cooperation uh, in the science and technology. Uh, certainly, South Korea and the United States uh, can cooperate as natural partners to uh, cope with this, these challenges. Uh, number two is the U.S.-China conflict. Uh, United States is South Korea's sole ally. And we have maintained a great a successful alliance for seven decades, almost seven decades. Uh, at the same time, China is our close neighbor and also 
uh, largest economic partner. So for the for Korea, the best scenario is to have uh, alliance with the United States and harmonize with China. Um, but it is increasingly becoming difficult for Korea uh, because of the growing competition and conflict uh, between two countries. Uh, I think it is very, most, very important that we should maintain a strong Korea-US alliance to cope with challenges from our side. But at the same time, Korea needs to minimize any damages, economic damages, uh, stemming from uh, conflict, potential conflict uh, with, with China. Uh, number three is North Korea. Uh, United States, South Korea and the United States uh, have successfully maintained the combined forces command to deter um, and defend any North Korean provocations uh, and to maintain peace and security in the Korean Peninsula. But in recent days, the North Korean behavior has become uh, more aggressive and more unpredictable. You have seen the uh, abrupt detonation of the liaison office in Kaesong by North Korea and also killing and burning of an unarmed Korean civilian in the North Korean waters. Uh, these are, these are egregious violations uh, of international law and crime against humanity. So I think it is very important that uh, South Korea and the United States should maintain strong alliance to deal with any challenges coming from North Korea. And certainly the most important task for us is to denuclearize North Korea so that we can live in a much more peaceful and stable uh, Korean Peninsula. Number four is U.S. presidential election. Um, certainly in Korea, as I've said at the beginning, we are watching what is going to happen uh, in, in your country uh, in terms of uh, selecting the next, next government. Uh, it's very important for uh, South Korea to maintain close partnership with the United States, no matter who is elected uh, as the next leader uh, of your country. Uh, we have the um, uh, free trade agreement between two countries. We have U.S. troops stationed on the Korean Peninsula. And it is absolutely important that the um, U.S. troop presence uh, should be maintained without any reduction or uh, any voice for withdrawal of U.S. troops uh, from Korea. I think it, it is vital for two countries to make efforts to contribute to the peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, one more point about the uh, end of war declaration. And I think that perhaps at some point, we need to take very serious consideration of this proposal, but I would like to argue that end of war declaration should be the exit, not the entrance to the process of denuclearization. Because uh, if uh, you uh, introduce any premature uh, end of war declaration, then it could probably uh, lead to a situation where you recognize North Korea as a de facto nuclear state and also creates excuse for the U.S. troop withdrawal, leading to a situation where peace and security on the Korean Peninsula can be more unstable or even dangerous. So uh, I would like to argue that between Korea and the United States, uh, we need to discuss this thing very seriously and to come to a very uh, reasonable understanding. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Um, I will turn it over to Congressman Yoho. Thank you, Kylie, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody's comments. And uh, uh, your comments, Mr. Park Jin, uh, are so uh, spot on as everybody's were. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity to join you all here today. 
It's a pe pleasure to speak alongside my counterparts in South Korea and regional experts on the issues that affect our bilateral relationship. The U.S. ROC Alliance continues to play a crucial role in securing peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region, particularly in the context of containing threats from North Korea and balancing or mediating rising tensions with China. However, our relationship has faced several challenges over the past several years, the chief of those being challenges in pursuing denuclearization on the peninsula. And that must start with a definition of what that means that everybody can agree with burden sharing negotiations and frictions in the rock Japan relationships. Over the past four years, the Trump administration has pursued, pursued a strategy towards North Korea that has resulted in incredible opportunities for breakthroughs on the denuclearization issues, including two high level summits and a period of warming ties between North and South. Unfortunately, progress on rhetoric did not result in any firm commitments from North Korea on denuclearization, and we have seen a return to an antagonizing strategy utilized by Kim Jong-un in order to frustrate our alliance into resignation. While some view this as a return to square one, I would urge my American and Korean colleagues to instead reflect on the progress we've made over the past few years in breaking through to North Korea and reaffirm ourselves to coordinating closely together on our denuclearization strategy. Additionally, we must work to present a united front to China and don't forget Russia and Iran. Ultimately, if we seek to pressure North Korea in an effective way that will prevent the regime from lashing out unnecessarily, we must target its source of funding and support to get consensus and concessions. Second, it's hard to overstate just how important the ongoing SMA negotiations are to the functionality of the U.S. ROC Alliance. As long as our negotiation teams remain unable to reach an agreement, our military readiness and capabilities of the USFK to deter and respond to threats will be severely impaired. Disagreements over the SMA negotiations have resulted in massive furloughs and a significant deterioration of goodwill between our two nations, and it serves neither one of us well. We must come together and find a common solution as soon as possible before our adversaries in North Korea, China, and Russia seek to fill that void. Finally, friction between South Korea and Japan over the past couple of years has seen the rock japan relationship reach one of the most contentious periods in decades. Historical issues between Japan and South Korea continue to severely hamper trilateral U.S. rock japan cooperation in regions, and, these, and the roots of these issues go back decades, if not centuries. We are certainly not going to be able to solve these issues here today, but there must be a recognition by our Korean and Japanese partners that we all face threats to our combined survival that transcend any historical grievances. We, we must raise our gaze to meet the challenges of our present time together as a unified front. The U.S. should play an active role in this process as well in helping to facilitate warmer ties between our regional partners. Ultimately, we must all work together to resolve these issues in a comprehensive manner for the sake of our shared security in the region. As Abraham Lincoln once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. The future of the U.S. rock relationships is bright and full of promises if we can manage to overcome the challenges that face us now. I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists on their views of the relationship and to taking your questions and thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, we need to dive right in because we don't have too much time here. Um, the presidential election one week from today, um, as everyone is keenly aware. Um, what do each of you think should be the single biggest foreign policy priority for potentially a second Trump term or for a Biden administration um, for the East Asia Pacific? And how do you think that single priority uh, will impact the US-South Korea alliance? Um, I wanna keep our answers short here so that we can get through a few issues. Um, Minister Kim, I will turn it over to you first. <laughs> uh, 미국 
Well, now then, whether it's a new government or the second Trump government, then what would be the most single biggest uh, foreign priority in East Asia, I would say, would be the issues with China. The U.S.-China relations, the tension should be lowered, business should be better, but then now actually we had moved in the opposite direction so far. So I believe that regarding this issue, then Korea, the U.S. and Japan cooperation, of course, obviously would be important, but also I believe that the U.S.-China dialogue would be more important. Now, basically in right. Korea, the U.S.-China confrontation could potentially lead to a new Cold War is one concern here in Korea. So we do hope that the next government, whoever it is, will have more active dialogue with China to lower tension and make sure that businesses will thrive. So it is uh, under that mood that perhaps we can also lead to better environment for the uh, U.S. North Korea dialogue as well. Wonderful. Um, why don't we go to Mark now? Thanks. A uh, bit of a tricky question for me as a career uh, public servant. I want to be careful about how I respond, but I think I would just say that, uh, you know, we're blessed uh, when we look at our alliance relationships, uh, whether it's with South Korea, with Japan, I think uh, we enjoy uh, very high public support. We enjoy bipartisan support. Uh, we enjoy very active uh, efforts by, by uh, the House of Representatives, by the Senate in promoting our alliances. And so I would expect that Regardless of what happens next week, our, our continued focus on strengthening alliances, uh, strengthening our relationships with our, our really, you know, true partners like like South Korea and Japan uh, will will continue. Dr. Park. Since I don't have the voting right for the U.S. presidential election, perhaps I can be a little more flexible here. Um, it looks like, based on the uh, election commitment by the two candidates uh, in Washington, uh, it looks like uh, China policy uh, will be perhaps the most important element of U.S.-Asia uh, policy and also towards the Korean Peninsula. Uh, if President Trump is re-elected, it looks like the United States will increase pressure uh, on China to a greater uh, extent uh, and perhaps uh, the U.S. demand is also expected to increase for countries like South Korea, Vietnam and New Zealand to participate in the so-called Quad, Quad Plus uh, framework. Um, the Korean government has kept its rather passive attitude in this discussion uh, saying that there has been no formal request from the United States to participate in this uh, multilateral security uh, framework. Uh, however, it is my personal view that Korea should take a more active role uh, in expanding the scope of participation in the regional peace and security cooperation. Um, on the other hand, if Biden administration takes office, it seems to me that the China policy will be pursued through competition and cooperation. Uh, and also countries like South Korea, Japan, and Australia will be asked to uh, upgrade uh, its uh, partnership and cooperation with the United States to deal with China's challenges. Uh, therefore, either way, uh, Korea's uh, role and Korea's choice uh, will be very important uh, in dealing with the uh, challenges of China and also uh, participating uh, in this regional uh, peace and security uh, di dialogue. Um, I, I think that it is very important that uh, after the presidential election and at some time uh, in early next year when the administration, uh, the new administration begins its uh, new term that 
two plus two uh, foreign and defense ministers meeting uh, takes place because uh, so far during the last three and a half years, we haven't had uh, any two plus two dialogue yet. And I think this is very important symbol in a way of partnership and close communication between the two countries. Um, as for the issue of defense cost sharing, I think the two countries uh, must um, find reasonable solution, reasonable and fair solution to the problem because Korea-US alliance is not just confined to numbers uh, of how much defense how much defense uh, cost Korea should pay uh, and also how much United States should pay. I think it transcends that uh, numbers and it deals with the uh, essential values of democracy, uh, free markets, uh, human rights and rule of law. So we should, we should find a solution as soon as possible to maintain okay, sound alliance. Great. I'm going to turn it over to Congressman Yoho, and then we'll come back to you as we carry on. Thank you, Kylie. Dr. Park, I think you're so right. It, it does transcend, um, you know, the monetary um, aspects of that. And uh, Mark, I have to give you credit. I see why you survived so long there. That was very adroitly uh, answered. Uh, <laughs> getting down to, you know, how's it going to look depending on who wins? I think if you see, my feeling is if when President Trump wins, you're going to see a more of a stabilization in the Asia Pacific region and a lot of places around the world. I think you're going to see a strong stand from the United States. I think you'll see a resolution of the SMA and I think you'll see North Korea come to the table. And I can say that because there is growing dissent around the world about China. There's a negative connotation. And as we build a coalition of nations around the world, not to be conflictory con um, or contentious with China, but just to get them to honor the rule of law, play by the social norms um, and the international codes, I think you'll see pressure put on China that China will have to change their ways. If President, uh, if uh, Joe Biden gets elected, what I can't predict to you exactly what he'll do, but I can look at his past performance and the Obama administration and what has happened. I think you'll see an emboldened China. I think you'll see more China influence in the area and, um, you got to keep in mind what happened in the previous thir three decades with North Korea. North Korea became emboldened. They grew their nuclear weapons. Um, and under President Trump, you know, the testing has stopped. Unfortunately, Kim Jong-un has moved forward with his ICBMs. And I think this is something that will be brought in check. So those are the two scenarios I see. But I think we'll see a stronger alliance between U.S. and Iraq. That is one of the strongest alliances outside of NATO in the world. But more importantly, the synergistic effect and the multiplier effect, when we repair the relationship between US, Rock, and Japan, that trilateral stool is like a pyramid. It is solid, it is strong, and it's a strong deterrence that we must have to make sure that there remains peace in the Indo-Pacific region. All right, thank you. You have provided a good bridge um, into a new topic. I think North Korea is worth us discussing for a few moments. Um, I'm wondering if um, you all think that a denuclearized uh, Korean peninsula is more or less likely after President Trump's first term, considering everything that happened, of course, you know, the summits that we saw, but also the fact that there was uh, nothing accomplished in rolling back North Korea's nuclear pro program during those summits. Do you guys think that there was actually um, some progress made uh, towards that uh, eventual end over the last four years? And I'm going to add to that, um, Vice President Biden during uh, the debate last week said that he would only meet with Kim Jong-un if he agreed uh, to get rid of at, you know, his nuclear program, that that was part of the conversation. Um, I believe that our Korean uh, officials here are going to believe that that bar is too high. Um, but what's the argument you would make for why that bar is too high? And uh, to our American colleagues, um, do you think that may be the right approach towards diplomacy? So I know there's a lot there, um, but let's, uh, let's go back to Congressman uh, Yoho to, to start us off. 
Sure, I appreciate that. And, you know, that's a that's meeting with preconditions. You can't move forward unless there is a strong definition of what denuclearization means. To us, it means no nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. You know, that means our weapons are gone. Everybody's weapons are gone. Kim Jong-un won't do that. Uh, that is his failsafe to protect his regime, to protect his status, to protect his power, gives him credibility. And um, I think what Donald Trump did, meeting with him one-on-one -on -one outside of the diplomats, no offense, Mark, to sit down, because go back over the last 30 years, Kylie, 30 years of people sitting down through the diplomatic channels, it did not work. And so I think it was time for a change in techniques. Um, whether you, you said, did anything good come out of this? What I know when you deal with people in business, you do business with people you know, like, and trust. And I think that's true for nations. And you can't trust people if you don't meet with them. And I think the best way to do that is for Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump to sit across the table, learn each other, work from that, and then bring your diplomatic core in there. But we have to get an agreement of what denuclearization is and how it's going to work. And Kim Jong-un has, has to have the security and the certainty that he can move into a market economy by maintaining power, kind of like what we saw happen in Vietnam. It's a communist country, but yet they're a market-driven economy and they're doing great. And they're our 16th largest trading partner and a strong partner of ours in the South China area. And I think the same thing can happen with Kim Jong-un if he opens up his horizon uh, and looks around. I'll end it there. Gotcha. All right, um, Mr. Kim, uh, what do you think? Do you think we are closer uh, to a denuclearized Korean Peninsula after President Trump's first term or further away? Now, thinking back to 2017, at a time when it was close to a war, so much so that the U.S. even implied military action. So it was almost at the rock bottom. Now, three years from then on, we see that, yes, despite North Korea's verbal provocations, so verbal provocations, but when we look at their actions, then we see that they are quite restrained, still looking toward the U.S. So what the North Korea was, wants is dialogue and negotiations with respect, as was seen in the Singapore summit. Now, in the U.S., so after the presidential election, the dialogue that is that has come to a stalemate, and the U.S. must make the decision on whether restarting the dialogue will be advancing the U.S. interest or not. And I do believe that you will make the decision that is in the interest of the U.S. Now, if President Trump were to be elected again, then based on his experience of dialogue with the North Korean leader, we believe that this will actually accelerate the move toward new dialogue. And also, uh, Vice President Biden will take some time to review the past and also will do some exploration. So there is also some concern. But I believe that the direction is the same, and that is dialogue. So as long as the U.S. leads the dialogue, then it will contribute to peace and security on the Korean Peninsula. And I believe that the U.S. initiative of the dialogue would also be led by the U.S. ROC Alliance. So the U.S. ROC Alliance supporting the U.S.-North Korea dialogue, then we can reduce the risks on the Korean Peninsula and also accelerate the end toward the denuclearization. Mark, do you have anything to add here or would you rather move on to a different topic? I just uh, thanks. I'll I'll just actually um, a couple of points that uh, Congressman Kim Han Jung just made uh, about the first of all the centrality of the U.S. South Korea alliance in addressing uh, North Korean nuclear missile issues criti is critically uh, important uh, that our two countries stay in lockstep and that we are uh, fully lashed up going forward. Um, also, I just make the point that uh, while we have had uh, three le leader level meetings uh, between the President and Chairman Kim. Uh, we've also emphasized uh, constantly, virtually every day, that the door to diplomacy 
uh, remains open and that we are ready to sit down with the North, uh, you know, any place and any time. Uh, because we regard uh, dialogue and, and resolving these issues through diplomacy in a peaceful manner as, as being absolutely uh, paramount. Thank you. Dr. Park, the final remarks on this topic? Well, I, I don't think there is anything more effective uh, than international sanctions and pressures uh, on North Korea to renounce uh, its nuclear program and de denuclearize. Uh, as you have seen uh, in the Pyongyang Plaza on October 10th, North Korea came out with uh, enormous uh, new ICBMs and SLBMs and the rocket uh, launchers, uh, which graphically demonstrate that North Korea would not uh, easily give up its nuclear uh, ambition. And in fact, uh, Pyongyang has announced that this war deterrent should be kept uh, at any rate to protect this regime and protect the country. So I think that uh, international pressure and sanctions on North Korea will be perhaps the best way to achieve this denuclearization. Um, the summit diplomacy between uh, Washington and uh, Pyongyang, as President Trump has tried twice, uh, could be uh, effective or risky, depending uh, on the intention of Pyongyang, the intention of uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un. And I think that unfortunately, despite uh, the uh, highlighted summit in uh, Singapore and Hanoi, North Korea has wasted their opportunities. I think it was a historic chance for North Korea to make the right decision and to denuclearize, but I think that they just lost their opportunity. So I don't know if there is another uh, summit uh, meeting between American president and North Korean leader, whether that could produce really uh, the result that we want, uh, I'm not sure. Um, and I think that we need a very concrete roadmap uh, and also um, realistic negotiation strategy to make sure that North Korea can make the right choice. Great. Uh, we only have a few more minutes, but I do want to make sure that we touch upon um, the coronavirus pandemic um, as it continues to plague uh, the United States, of course. Um, and the world globally. Um, there were some remarks um, from HHS Secretary Azar last week that have gotten um, some attention because he said of South Korea's uh, response that they, you know, had a radically uh, different case profile and that they had, you know, arrested people um, who had been in contact with an outbreak at a church. And he said that the approach of South Korea, um, the legal and uh, cultural context just wouldn't work here in the United States. Um, I do not think that those comments are similar to what we have had uh, heard from other U.S. officials, including uh, Mark himself this morning, commending South Korea for the way that they handled uh, the coronavirus uh, outbreak. So I just want to, um, you know, close today in discussing um, if uh, the secretary's remarks are accurate, um, and why uh, there is a need to be careful in uh, characterizing how South Korea uh, handled the virus and the future for U.S.-South Korea uh, joint efforts to come up uh, with a vaccine and control this pandemic. So uh, let's go to South Korea first, and then we will close it uh, with our American counterparts. Uh, Dr. Park. Yes, I think that, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we need to uh, introduce more closer uh, cooperation to cope with the challenges of coronavirus uh, global pandemic. And I think that uh, Korea and United States are most natural partners to do that. Um, uh, the situation in Korea is, I think, uh, relatively uh, well under control. Uh, although there are concerns about the personal information protection, uh, and also the freedom uh, and human rights uh, in complying to the measures that are being introduced by the implemented by the government. Uh, and I think that uh, we need to find a kind of fine balance between the social, 
requirement to maintain uh, this kind of uh, close control to prevent the expansion of the uh, pandemic disease, uh, but also at the same time, maintaining the basic democratic values of freedom uh, and the civil liberty together. So I think we need to discuss these things between Korea and the United States to find the, the best solution uh, and the right approach to, uh, to overcome this crisis together. Uh, Congressman Kim, uh, and, and do you have any uh, responses specifically to the comments uh, that Secretary Azar made last week? Well, the COVID-19 being quashed by public power and uh, policing force in Korea, well, that I would say is really contrary to the reality. Now, Korea, we were effective in fighting against COVID-19 thanks to the citizens' volunteer participation. And we have never gone into lockdown in any city or any area. And we have also been quite flexible in the social distancing measures as well. So I'm not sure uh, where such information came from. But now, sometimes in Korea, now there are some, let's say, uh, right wing political groups. They would go against the uh, health measures and to have uh, unlawful protests or demonstrations. In such a case, then the police would also control that. But then that is really not representative of what we have done here. So that is by no means the key to our success. So that was the question, right? That was the question. Uh, Congressman Yoho and uh, Mark, we've got one more minute. So if you guys could sum up uh, your responses to that uh, in 30 seconds, that All would right. be great. Um, the COVID vi virus will pass, this pandemic will pass. We should educate the people on what a virus does and what it doesn't, and then work together on those things that we can all work and share together. The pandemic uh, brought to light the, the risk of having a supply chain in one area of the, of the world that we need to diversify, and we can do that through our allies. And I'll cut it off there and give Mark some time, thanks. Thanks, Congressman. I would just uh, repeat what I said at the top. Uh, I think places like uh, Korea, Taiwan, uh, New Zealand, these are, these, are, these are locations to be commended for how they responded. They, they relied upon openness, transparency, uh, never undermined their democratic values, uh, contrary to uh, others in the region uh, who uh, were absolutely relying on surveillance tools and other, other aspects of a surveillance state to, uh, to control things. That's not the answer. I mean, as an open society, Korea has shown us that they can get back to, to normal, they can hold an election. And so I think, uh, as, as I said, they're a real model, a real exemplar of how to deal with this. Thank you. Um, and thanks to all four of you for joining us this morning. Um, this event is going to continue on. Um, and I wanna turn it over to Barry Pavel. He is uh, the director and senior vice president of the Scrocoff Center. Um, he is wonderful and he is going to provide the introduction to our next distinguished speaker. Barry. Thank you so much, Kylie. And hello to our audience tuning in from all over the world. I'm Barry Pavel. I'm a senior vice president at the Atlantic Council and director of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security here. And I'd like to start by thanking our fantastic first panel for their insights on the future of the US-Korea Alliance. Here in the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, we work to develop sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and its allies and partners. And it strikes me that the Korean Peninsula represents one of the most critical geopolitical flashpoints in the Indo-Pacific region in the COVID era. As we work to honor the late General Brent Scowcroft's legacy, including his reputation as an honest broker devoted to bridging gaps in understanding, we are delighted to have this important opportunity for direct dialogue with all of our American and Korean speakers today. To that end, as we look forward to the second half of today's strategic dialogue, it is my distinct honor to introduce a longtime friend of the Atlantic Council, Dr. Chung In Moon, 
whom we are delighted to be hosting for remarks ahead of our second panel. Dr. Moon hardly needs an introduction, but I should note that he serves as a special advisor to President Moon for Unification and National Security Affairs. His latest role in an illustrious career that has included senior roles across the Korean government. And as we look ahead in this era of strategic uncertainty, we are truly fortunate to hear from someone who has had such deep experience and cutting edge knowledge of the most pressing matters facing Korea today. I have no doubt his remarks will be full of insights. And so without further ado, let us hear from Dr. Moon. Dr. Moon, over to you, please. And so nice to see you. Thank you. I'll you know, make comments on the, you know, the first sessions, you know, discussions. Those discussions were very rich, balanced, and informative. You know. But I have several questions on you know, my American friends. Uh, nowadays, you know, we are facing the, the advent of the new Cold War. I would like to ask a question. Is it inevitable? We Koreans have a very bitter memory of the Cold War, National Division. Korean War, protracted conflict on the Korean Peninsula. And uh, we are a peninsula state, therefore we supposed to enjoy the double advantage of connecting continental you know, land as well as maritime in the space. But we were crippled. Therefore, we Koreans really want that there, there wouldn't be any uh, cold, cold war resurgent again. Uh, that is why I want to ask my American friends that uh, is Cold War, new Cold War inevitable? Can it be avoided? No. Uh, there is a real concern of you know, the Koreans. And second, as uh, uh, Dr. Park Jin pointed out, okay, United States is our number one ally, while China is our strategic cooperative partner. Therefore, our priority goes to the United States. But in doing that, we have some concerns. If the United States forces us to form a some kind, to join some kinds of you know, uh, military alliance against China, then I think that will pose a very existential you know, dilemma to us. Suppose we allow uh, the deployment of additional THAAD or deployment of inter intercontinental ballistic missile you know, or intermediate ballistic in a missile targeting China. Uh, suppose we join the military exercise along the Cross Strait, as well as the South China Sea, that China will treat us as an enemy. China will, you know, aiming its uh, Dongfeng in you know, a missile series against South Korea. Uh, you know, China will be, you know, making military provocation along the West Sea, as well as Cadiz. How can we you know, respond to that one? Would and can the U.S. protect us? Another dilemma is this. Suppose we join the United States, then China will be strengthening northern tripartite alliance system involving China, Russia, North Korea. North Korea has not, uh, China has not provided North Korea with any military assistance and weapons and logistic support since 1958. But if that happens, then China will resume it's assistance to military weapons, logistic support to you know, North Korea, including oil. Then conventional threat from North Korea, in addition to nuclear threat, will be further strengthened. Then how can we deal with that kind of dilemma? Another one is economic decoupling. Who would be the victims of that decoupling? Small, medium firms. And small, you know, really small and poor now, the people who have been earning from the Chinese tourism, they will be the primary victims. Can the Moon Jae-in government accommodate kind, that kind of choice? I'm very doubtful. Therefore, I really hope that American friends pay attention to that kind of you know, dilemma which we are facing. Another one, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. I agree with Congressman Yoho's definition. There should be no nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula in accordance with the joint declaration on the denuclearization of Korean Peninsula, which was adopted in December 1991, period. But in doing that, I still see the virtue of top-down approach which President Trump pursued. 
And also, when I saw that you know, Joe Biden's debate with uh, President Trump last week, uh, he was you know mentioning you know the, he come with a term like that outright elimination of nuclear weapons, but the drawing down of nuclear you know capacity, and also even he referred to the nuclear free zone uh, in Korea, and those are very very positive remarks. And also he's a you know known pragmatist, therefore he will combine top-down approach with bottom-up approach. Of course, he will be much more prudent, but he will be listening to each ally, his ally, South Korea. Therefore, I think that you know, Seoul and Washington will, will be able to come up with a you know, very constructive and wise approach to North Korean nuclear problem. And as to the ROKVS alliance, we have uh, several pending issues, you know, defense co-sharing issues that involves the issue of fairness and also procedural issue too. Okay, if in order to accommodate President Trump's demand, then we should amend the special measures, special measures you know, agreement. Okay, and and also the amount of money the Trump administration has been requesting is quite high. Okay, and our National Assembly may not you know approve that kinds of budget. Therefore. And I hope that our American friends you know, understand the Korean situation too. And the transfer of wartime operational control, and I think the Pentagon and our Ministry of National Defense will come up with you know, wise so solution to the problem. Therefore, they are not the really critical problems, you know. And, but the whole issue is the North Korean issue and China issue. You know, that will be the major issues. Finally, I'm somewhat different from you know, the Dr. Park Chin about her end of war declaration. And Dr. Park uh, argued that end of war declaration should be an exit rather than entrance. But I would argue in a different way. Uh, end of war declaration should be an entrance that can facilitate denuclearization of North Korea, as well as overall peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Exit should be lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. And also, I do not you know, worry about all this status of American forces in South Korea, uh, because there is a shared understanding between North and South Korea, even in the United States. Even though we adopt the end of war declaration, I really don't think that there will be a uh, change of status of American forces in South Korea. President Moon Jae-in made it very clear, because status of American forces in South Korea is a matter of alliance between Washington and Seoul. There is no room for North Korea to intervene in that issue. If North Korea insists on that, then and the word declaration may not be adopted. But still we can try so that we can facilitate and expedite the process of denuclearization of North Korea. And also, who knows, and the word declaration the, if the adoption of end, end of war declaration can lead to improve the U.S. DPRK relations, then that could come up with much more, you know, better result for all of us. I'll stop here. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will take a brief 10-minute break, and we'll be back with our uh, exciting second panel on the U.S.-Korea Economic Partnership. So please join us again at 925.
Oh, good morning. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Josh Lipsky. I'm the director of the Geoeconomic Center here at the Atlantic Council. And we are so pleased today to be having this conversation on the USROK Economic Partnership, the new era of US-China competition. And I wanna thank the Scowcroft Center and the Asian Security Initiative for inviting the Geoeconomic Center to be part of today's event. And we all know that the economic relationship is I remember being at Seoul with President Obama as far as was being negotiated. We know one thing to make sure, and that's that this part prosperity both the American and the Korean people. And so I'm so excited today to have an distinguished panel to have this conversation with today. And so let me introduce our panel and then we'll get into the conversation. First, we have Minister Taeho Park, president of Lee Co. Global Congress Institute and Professor Emeritus and former dean of the Graduate School of International Studies at Seoul National University. He served as Minister of Trade for Korea from Ambassador of the National Economy and Trade in May 4th. We also have Dr. Sengju Lee, a professor of political science and international relations at Tsukuni University. So he's PhD in political science from the University of Singapore. So he's previously taught at National University of Singapore and Yonsei University. We have Bob Doner with us, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, Bob recently completed a career of 20 years at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where he served in five successive administrations. His last position was Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Economic Analysis and Senior Asia Advisor. And Dr. Mian Oh, the Director of the Asia Security Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. And my partner, Mian, thank you for inviting us to be part of today's event. So we're going to begin today with opening statements briefly and then get into our conversation. So let me start with Minister Bark. Thank you uh, for your kind introduction. We had some audio uh, problems uh, when you speak, but now we can hear you well. Well, good morning, uh, Washington DC and uh, good evening from Korea. Well, I prepare a, a very brief uh, opening remarks uh, to, to extend our discussion later. Uh, I would like to start by briefly uh, mentioning uh, the impact of global challenges on the Korea-US bilateral trade performance. According to the Korea International Trade Association, the US-China trade disputes and the COVID-19 pandemic did give a negative impacts on the Korea-US bilateral trade, but the impacts are not much, uh, 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 much smaller, relatively smaller than the impact on the Korea's overall trade performance. In other words, uh, Korea's uh, Korea-US trade volumes are negatively affected, but uh, it was okay compared to the overall. Uh, Impact, negative impact on uh, Korea's trade performance. Experts in Korea are, are saying that this is may, uh, may be due to the uh, Koros FTA, uh, which has been uh, faithfully implemented since uh, 2012. Let me move to uh, the issue of so-called industrial decoupling between the US and China. Uh, before looking into this issue, I'd like to briefly explain Korea's trade relations with China, which is Korea's number one uh, trading partner since 2004. The most uh, noticeable pattern of the bilateral trade is that uh, about 80% of Korea's export to China are parts and components, not final goods. On the other hand, uh, Korea's imports of intermediate goods from China are much smaller. Of course, uh, uh, some Korean firms in China would consider 
moving uh, their production as well as assembly facilities to other regions like Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, and India, or even they, considering, they are considering investing uh, in uh, the U.S. to avoid the security risks. However, some other firms would like to change their strategies to focus more on the Chinese domestic market, which is growing very rapidly these days. So these Korean firms may expand their operations in China. Considering these uh, Korea's uh, specific trade relations with China, it seems that Korean firms are not too much concerned about the industrial decoupling between the U.S. and China, at least for the time being. Next, I'd like to say a few words on the U.S.-China trade conflicts and the current world trading system. I think there are uh, three key controversial issues behind the U.S. and China uh, trade disputes. First, the developing country status of China. Second, China's improper protection of intellectual properties and cutting-edge technologies of foreign companies. And the third, the problem of China's state capitalism. It would be very important for all of us to realize that China-related issues are not the only concern of the United States, but also it threatens the world trade order. However, the current multilateral trading system is not able to address these issues involved in the U.S.-China trade disputes. In addition, the WTO faces serious challenges. All WTO members know that very well the importance of the WTO reform. However, it is extremely difficult to reach a consensus on any issues among 164 members. Therefore, some other options may be sought for in parallel with the WTO reform efforts. For example, high standard regional trade agreements, we call RTAs, or plurilateral trade agreements, we call PTAs, among like-minded members of the WTO may be explored. Let me now turn to the leadership crisis in the world trading system. I do not need a lengthy discussion on this issue. I simply hope to see U.S. leadership again in reforming the multilateral trading system as well as engaging in RTAs and PTAs. Of course, the U.S. cannot do this alone. The U.S. needs like-minded partners to move, in, to move things forward. We also believe the U.S.-China trade conflict will remain even after the U.S. presidential election. Experts are expecting the U.S. to continue to tackle China problems. But this time, we'd like to, we'd like to see the U.S. Uh, work together with its, ally, uh, its allies instead of taking unilateral actions. At this stage, we definitely need the U.S. leadership in the world trading system and dealing with the China problem, regardless who will become the next uh, president of the United States. However, these changes in the U.S. trade policy stance may be more probable when uh, Vice President Biden is elected as the new U.S. president. If the President Trump is re-elected, experts are not sure whether he will pay any attention to the reform of the WTO and or working with like-minded countries. Lastly, but not least, I would like to say a few words on a dilemma Korea is facing. These days, we often hear that uh, sooner or later, or even now, Korea will be asked to take a choice between the U.S. and China. But it will be very difficult for a middle power nation like Korea to take sides. Moreover, China and the U.S. are Korea's number one and number two trading partners, respectively. In this context, it might be useful the, for the Korean government to establish some kind of uh, guiding principles in dealing with these sensitive situations. As for uh, trade-related issues, for example, the Korean government may declare that it respects the principles of market economy and free trade and supports the multilateral trading system based on non-discrimination. 
with these kind of principles, Korea can make uh, consistent positions with a reasonable justification for our own people. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. And I want to turn it over to Bob Doner next for his comments. And uh, we'll have, as I said, the brief opening and then get into our conversation. Well, thanks very much, Josh. It's a pleasure to be here with um, this event with the East Asia Foundation. And um, I want to acknowledge the excellent remarks of Minister Bach. Um, in a period of global pandemic and global recession, and on the eve of a US presidential election with two candidates with very different views on the United States and the US role in the uh, global community, it's easy to be preoccupied with the near term prospect. But in fact, there are underlying stresses in the global economic and strategic environment that have strengthened in the past few years and will continue to strengthen in the future that affect both the need for the United States and Korea to cooperate, and also their ability to cooperate. Uh, the first of these stresses is the turn of the United States away from globalization and greater suspicion of international trade. Um, there is a sharp increase in import competition in the United States, uh, big drop in manufacturing employment, and in fact, the median real wage in the US has been unchanged since the 1990s. Um, even if Joe Biden is elected president a week from today, the trade policy that his administration adopts will almost certainly be not the same trade policy as the four presidential administrations that preceded Donald Trump. Second, stress is, of course, the strategic competition between the United States and China, which increasingly is playing out in the economic and technological sphere. U.S. tariffs has significantly altered the economics of international production and global supply chains, putting stresses on any firm, any country that is involved in those chains, and the use of sanctions on the U.S. side on transactions with identified firms or entities, and on the Chinese side, uh, denying the Chinese market for, uh, you know, uh, offenses that, uh, that uh, offend the Chinese people, uh, also affect all countries that are involved in, in trade in the region. The third stress is technological change, and particularly technological developments that have erased the boundaries between commercial technology and national security technology. Um, and have also extended the range of vulnerabilities well beyond uh, the previous set to include infrastructure, personal data, and in fact, anything that's connected by a computer network. As Minister Bach mentioned, Korea is particularly exposed to trade conflicts between the United States and China. Uh, 43. Exports can constitute 43% of Korea's GDP. That's the highest in the OECD. And in fact, 78% of the domestic value added in Korea in the ICT and technology industries arises from sales overseas. Um, Korea is also dependent, heavily dependent on the Chinese market. 26% of Korea's exports go to China versus only 12% to the United States in the number two position. And finally, Korea plays a critical role now in the development of new technologies. 5G, artificial intelligence, advanced memory chips are all significant examples. And competition, technological competition and text-based restrictions will inevitably involve Korea and Korean firms. Now, the challenge for Korea, as Mr. Bob mentioned, is how to navigate these pressures of both the dependence on international trade and being caught between the United States and China in the economic sphere. And I completely agree with him that a good approach for Korea is to emphasize principles and avoid direct conflict. The United States, will need allies in the region as the economic and military balance changes over time. 
And for the United States, the challenge will be um, to avoid putting Korea and other East Asian nations in the position of having to make a choice explicitly between China and the United States. Uh, basically allowing them, making it easier for them to choose to align with the United States in the future. I'll stop there. Thank you, Rob. And Dr. Lee, let me turn to you next. Oh, thank you for your kind introduction. And I'm very pleased to join uh, today's session. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity to cultivate common understanding about what is going on in the context of U.S.-China strategic competition and its likely impact on the world. Uh, in the interest of time, I would like to be as brief as possible. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention that, that Korea and the United States face numerous challenges in the context of the U.S.-China strategic competition and the intensification of the U.S.-China strategic competition actually uh, creates a lot of diplomatic challenges for South Korea because the strategic competition between the countries tends to create a, create a issue of uh, strategic choice between uh, the United States and China for South Korea. So in order to avoid such a situation, South Korea tries to focus on on uh, the cooperation uh, areas of cooperation with the United States, including such issues that are based on universal values and norms. At the same time, the issues uh, that can produce a kind of the substantial as well as the tangible outcomes. That is the kind of the bottom line for the future-oriented uh, Korea-U.S. Uh, economic partnerships. Having said that, I uh, I would like to mention that uh, Korea and the United States tries to improve the uh, economic partnership at three-dimensional level, bilateral, regional, as well as uh, multilateral. At the bilateral level, the Korea and the United States try to constantly improve economic partnership and cooperation uh, to play a leading role uh, in terms of the redesigning the future global economic order. So I think uh, uh, both countries had the experience of setting the global standard for the world trading order back in the, uh, 2012 when the conclusion of the COROS FT was made. So that was a kind of the both countries' suggestion for the uh, entire world in terms of the uh, future direction of the economic partnership as well as the rule making in, uh, in, in the uh, global economy. Secondly, uh, at the regional level as well, uh, the intensification of the uh, rivalry between the US-led Indo-Pacific strategy and the China's Belt and Road Initiative uh, has become a reality in, uh, in this region. Uh, at the same time, uh, South Korea should seek a bilateral as, the, as well as the regional cooperation with the United, United States to ease uncertainties in terms of the regional economic order. That is one of the areas we have to seek uh, cooperation with the United States at, at the bilateral as well as the regional level. Uh, in this sense, uh, South Korea and the United States should seek uh, or it should find a way to link the Indo-Pacific strategy and the South Korea's new southern policy. That is one of the kind of the linkage where both uh, countries can find uh, 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 find the ways of cooperation at the regional level. Uh, and so, uh, Korea and the United States also should seek a global. Uh, a cooperation for the global issues, particularly given the uh, uh, spread of the COVID-19. Uh, so because of the uh, COVID-19, it, it has become clear that the institutional foundation of the multilateralism has been very vulnerable and weak. 
And in that regard, the bilateral cooperation between, the, between Korea and the United States has become more crucial than ever. And, and I think in that sense, it is a kind of welcome sign that State Secretary Mike Pompeo mentioned that uh, uh, it is highly important to seek bilateral cooperation with South Korea in order to cope with uh, COVID-19 at the global level. So in it was a kind of the uh, very opportune uh, remarks uh, from the United States side and then uh, by taking advantage of the uh, COVID-19 uh, responses to the COVID-19, the uh, both South Korea and United States can find a way to strengthen the multilateralism uh, in order to deal with uh, not just to deal with the COVID-19, but also with the uh, other global issues as well. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, and I'm so glad you brought up the global economic system, uh, which I think is so critical to the South Korea US partnership. And there's so much good work that can be done there. And we'll get into that in our conversation. Dr. Oh, Mian, let me turn to you for the final round of the concluding and the opening remarks, and then we're gonna get into our conversation. Thank you, Josh. And it, it is such an honor to be part of this um, distinguished panel. And also thank you, uh, for, thank you for joining us at the moment from Seoul and Washington, DC. So since our um, you know, great panel has already um, you know, cover a lot of issue. I'll try to make my remarks really brief. And, and it is true that US-China relations are certainly at one of the lowest points across almost all domains. And the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the ongoing decline of the US-China relations even further, making it clear that the relationship has broken fundamentally from the trajectory of the past four decades. There seems to be a large degree of bipartisan consensus that the bilateral relationship will continue to be competitive going forward, regardless of the next U.S. administration. The key question is whether the United States and China can decouple completely in the long term, and if so, how much the United States, China, and the rest of the world are ready for the decoupling. To answer this question, one important thing to note that stakeholders in the Indo-Pacific that are involved in this US-China decoupling and great power competition directly or indirectly have different understandings and conceptions about the definition of decoupling. And Chinese dual circulation strategy laid out by President Xi Jinping um, to cut its dependence on overseas investment in markets and technology in the long term and focus on domestic production, distribution, and consumption is obviously a major policy shift uh, brought by um, US-China strategic competition and decoupling. The dual strategy is driven by major effort and commitment to high-tech infrastructure development, um, such as 5G, AI, artificial intelligence, big data, and electric vehicles. So regardless of the next US administration, events and emerging technologies, as well as the data security, will continue to be main areas of competition between the United States and States United States and China, I think. And um, like Minister Park and Bob uh, mentioned, given Korea's economic you know, heavy reliance and its, its industrial structure, um, Korea is structurally vulnerable to external pressures as the US and China you know, tensions in, intensify. So the growing protectionist, prote um, protectionist pressure, such as export controls, as well as skepticisms about uh, globalization are creating significant challenges for Korea, which remains heavily dependent on trade. Moreover, Korea is deeply embedded in global supply chains, which is sensitive to any policies that alter ge geographic patterns of um, production. So this is not just a problem uh, for Korea, but also the United States, because it can weaken the alliance. The United States and Korea can reduce this structural vulnerability by broadening the scope of economic cooperation between the two countries in the areas including um, advanced technology and digital economy, such as quantum computing and autonomous vehicle and in um, semiconductor industry, like by um, establishing steering committee or really boost up the private public partnerships, which I hope we can um, delve into into the later conversation. And I would like to quickly mention um, to follow on Dr. Lee's point on NSP and ISP. So it is true that two countries um, have already demonstrated the strengths and um, of maintaining 
maintaining regular high level dialogues and also signing uh, MOUs. And I think um, the next step is to uh, focus on operation, operationalizing Committee uh, operationalizing the effort they have. Um, they have said that they are going to commit um, during the session one. Uh, Mark Nepper um, he mentioned um, um, the areas of potential collaboration such as cyber, you know, cyber security and counterterrorism. So I think, um, given the interest of our session, um, new southern policy and indo pacific strategy could focus on operationalizing in the area of prosperity pillar on energy, infrastructure, um, digital connectivity, et cetera. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Beyond. And you, you've raised and all the panelists have raised so many topics to dive into in this economic partnership. Uh, and we're going to try to get into them now. And uh, just I ask the panelists to be as brief as possible so we can get to as many issues as possible. And I want to just start with something that everyone touched on in one way or another, and that's the US election. And it's one week from today, it's front and center on everyone's mind, thinking through the differences between a second Trump administration or a first Biden administration. And Minister Bach, I wanted to start with you and then ask our panelists, and you touched on this in your remarks, what do you see as the fundamental difference in the first six months, in the first year, in a second Trump administration or a first Biden administration? And maybe a related question, what should the policy priorities be of either administration and how would they be approached differently? And I know you touched on that a little, but I think for our audience, it's helpful to really focus on that question uh, from you and all of our panelists. Okay, uh, if you ask me uh, what uh, kind of priority the new uh, US administration after the election uh, will give. I was talking to other people too. I think, uh, generally speaking, new president or repeated president will pay more attention to domestic uh, economic issues rather than external issues. So if you ask me uh, about the uh, uh, policy directions uh, in terms of external uh, economic policy, like trade policy, then I can say something uh, like uh, uh, Trump uh, is elect, re elected, then he will push more uh, to, to, to China. But uh, we don't know uh, whether his approach or his style will be changed or not. But uh, one thing we hope uh, if Biden is re elected, maybe the approach to China, the approach to multilateral trading system, especially the reform of WTO, will be a little bit different from the uh, of Trump administration. So we, we hope that the uh, U.S. will show some leadership in uh, shaping, reshaping the you know, multilateral trading system with uh, other you know, like-minded countries or allies uh, to, to support the multilateral trading system. Also in dealing with uh, China issues, maybe uh, the Biden government may suggest that uh, maybe we can go back to TPP or uh, extend the CPTPP to include the uh, United States, uh, that kind of you know, possibility uh, we can expect, I mean, as far as trade policy of the United States is concerned. I will stop here. Thank you. And so, Bob, let me turn to you on that. Do you think that would be a possibility in a Biden administration, or a return to TPP or some form of the revised TPP? And what would that look like versus what the trade priorities would be and the China priorities would be in a second Trump administration? Well, if there's a second Trump administration, then President Trump will view this as a vindication of his political genius and nothing will change except that we'll have more of it than before. Uh, if it's a Biden administration, I agree with Dr. Hart that the first priority will be the domestic economy both economic recovery and dealing with the COVID pandemic. Uh, the campaign has also been very clear that the that a President Biden would work very quickly to reassure U.S. allies that, in their words, we're back and that we have you here back. Uh, the Biden administration would continue the confrontation with China, but I think, at least hopefully, with a greater sense of strategy and definition of the policy, uh, as well as an attempt to incorporate allies in uh, disputes with or relations with China. Trade policy is likely to be a later priority for the administration. 
and a cautious priority because trade is a sensitive plank issue for the Democratic Party. And because Biden, I think, is more of an economic pop populist than the candidates that preceded him. Um, I actually think a return to TPP is possible for the United States. It would be later in the first term, and it would follow the pattern of past administrations when you have a, an agreed uh, trade agreement that hasn't been ratified, which is to say that it has substantial drawbacks. We're going to renegotiate it. We've renegotiated it. We've solved the problems. Now it's a good agreement for the United States. Um, so I that if the United States joins the TPP, that would be the way it would work out. Thank you, Bob, and thank you. I, I agree with you. I, I think that that the way you laid it out made sense timeline-wise for priorities for a potential new Biden administration, and of course the politics of re-entering the TPP will be delicate. Um, so it would not probably be the first thing out of the gate, as you say. Dr. Lee, let me turn to you on this. And you talked about re remaking and revitalizing global economic system. And so I'm wondering what you think that would look like under President Biden, and if that's possible under a second term of President Trump. Uh, actually, from the perspective of South, South Korea, um, in terms of substance of policy, particularly China policy and trade policy, I don't see much difference between Biden and Trump. Uh, actually, the, uh, both, both camps are strongly committed to protecting uh, U.S. interests as well as enhancing U.S. competitiveness. And also, they are highly committed uh, to protecting the U.S. Uh, labor workers. And the uh, Democratic Party actually pledged to insert uh, provisions on the protection of American workers into the new trade agreements. And the uh, uh, Republican Party also promised to enact uh, uh, fair trade rules that protect uh, American jobs. In that, in that regard, I, I don't see much difference between the uh, two uh, between the two parties, but at the same time, uh, in terms of China policy, I think both sides will continue to put pressure on China, uh, particularly uh, citing the uh, issues related to a uh, very close government business relations and industrial policy and currency manipulation and uh, uh, government subsidies, etc., etc. They will keep uh, uh, raising those issues in dealing with China. But one thing uh, I would like to mention is that uh, there might be some changes in the coming years in the United States in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of the how to deal with China in terms of the approach. Uh, I think the recently US government began to place higher priority on international cooperation. Of course, uh, the Trump administration produced some tangible uh, outcomes in dealing bilaterally dealing with China. But at the same time, there is a clear sign that uh, there, there is a limitation of the bilateral approach. In that sense, the, uh, regardless of who will be the next president uh, of the United States, there will be uh, some kind of changes in approach uh, to place higher priority, priority on international cooperation. I think that in that regard, the economic prosperity network is a kind of, uh, is one of the such uh, sign uh, signaling that uh, uh, U.S. allies and partners should uh, uh, work on the uh, multilateral cooperation with the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. And Mian, I want to turn to you on this question, on the priorities question, but I also want to use it to transition to our next segment on 5G. And so first, your response to what the other panelists have said, but second on 5G. And as you know, as we all know, the US ROK, the senior economic dialogue took place last week. 5G was a key component of that. They explored a range of issues, the clean network issues. Uh, we heard what US Undersecretary Keith Patch has said, and this issue of the USROK cooperation on 5G and the clean network, I, th I think we would agree points to a broader dynamic in the Indo-Pacific right now, where the US is really sort of asking allies to choose 
uh, between China, between systems. And so my question to you, Mian, and to all the panelists on this is, is that feasible? Is that possible? Is it asking our allies to make a choice that's really impossible to make? And what should our allies like Korea do when faced with this choice, um, if it still is put upon them uh, going forward in the Trump administration? So Mian, that's a lot uh, to put on your plate, but I, I know you can handle it. Thank you, Josh. And um, uh, I'd like to briefly explain what um, the Clean Network means and then what are the very similar initiatives driven by the US government um, to, um, to really talk about uh, potential areas of US rock collaboration. So the Clean Network program is the Trump administration's comprehensive approach to addressing the long-term threats to data, privacy, security, human rights, and trusted collaboration posed by the Chinese Communist Party, CCP. It requires a multi-year commitment to carriers, app stores, cloud computing, and subsea cables by a coalition of trusted partners. And during the senior economic dialogue you just mentioned, the United States asked Korea to join the 5G clean path, which was added later um, to establish an end-to-end -end communication path that does not use any transmission, control, computing, or storage equipment from untrusted IT vendors, such as Huawei and ZTE, as we know well. And other US efforts to develop a co coalition of trusted partners to respond to the rise of China and achieve US-China decoupling include Blue Dot Network, Economic Prosper Network that Dr. Lee just mentioned, and Energy Resources Governance Initiative, um, and the Quad Relic Security Dialogue, the Quad. And the Blue Dot Network is to finance and certify infrastructure projects around the world that meet high standards that are transparent and market driven announced by the United States, Japan, and Australia. Energy Resources Governance Initiative is the US effort to bring in trusted partners to enhance supply chain security of critical energy minerals, such as rare earth minerals that China accounts for um, more than 80% of the, the world supply. And the US government is seeking um, to combine this existing initiative uh, with the Quad partners to amplify its effort to respond to the rise of China more collectively. And I think um, our panel, um, we, we um, have an agreement in terms of the fact that uh, in terms of our speculation that the tech competition will be likely continue regardless of the US, uh, next US administration. So I like to say that US and Korea should develop a new smart partnership that focuses on advanced and emerging technologies in order to meet the rapid pace of digitalization that actually you know, has been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, and the central focus would be increasing product services and supply chain security in the ICT sector. Actually, Bob and I um, co-authored a chapter of U.S. Rock Economic Partnership um, in our forthcoming report of the future of U.S. Rock Alliance, and I'd like to briefly mention what we put together for the policy recommendation. And uh, number one, I think U.S. and South Korea should cooperate to develop a more secure artificial intelligence, not merely for economic benefits, but to develop and set standards for ethical use. Two, the U.S. and Korean government should work together to facilitate deeper U.S. rock private sector partnership on autonomous vehicle. Uh, while Hyundai is leading on um, this development as a leading car manufacturer, but uh, the company lags behind firms like Baidu and Google in auto software technology, such as AI sensors and logic chips, where the United States has comparative advantage. And um, there is no ongoing government level cooperation between the two countries at the moment on autonomous vehicle um, and collaboration at the government level to establish shared mechanism and uh, such as safety standards vehicles will be important mechanism to make it easier for the US and Korean firms to jointly develop auto autonomous technologies. And then the third and final, uh, final point, US Korea can cooperate to promote responsible global development and deployment of 5G infrastructure, which is central to your question. While the latest US commerce and uh, commerce restrictions Huawei, the executive order put Korean companies in a very difficult position, but there is still room for collaborating uh, collaboration between the two countries. 
they could should consider establishing a steering committee that consists of experts from the industry and policy community to offer a platform to discuss how to reconcile national security concerns with economic security. And this bilateral effort could eventually be linked to emerging multilateral effort to coordinate the world leading 10 democracies on 5G. I'll stop here. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Mian. I think that's it's so fascinating. And you know, the work we do at Geoeconomics is right there, the intersection of economic priorities and national security priorities. So I think that's a, a wonderful proposal on the commission. Uh, Minister Bach, let me turn to you on the 5G question. And you know, do you think, one, the approach the U.S. has taken so far is the right one? And would you agree with what Dr. O has outlined in terms of some of the way forward? And then kind of back to the original question, is a discrete choice really even possible? Uh, that the U.S. is asking allies like South Korea to make right now? Well, actually, if you ask this question to the companies, then they will say that this is not the right uh, thing to do because we are uh, Korean firms are confused. Some Korean firms actually have benefited from uh, U.S. Uh, sanction on 5G. Uh, for example, Samsung won a you know, more than $6 billion project in providing wireless uh, uh, Verizon network and all kinds of things. So he got the benefit. But uh, some other firms are having difficulties in exporting semiconductors to, uh, to China because it is, you know, kind of, uh, you, you need a license or you, you need a approval before you export to, uh, to, to Huawei or other Chinese companies. So I think uh, as far as 5G is concerned, we understand the reason why U.S. is doing it. But if you expand, this kind of criteria to other you know areas uh, to you know tackle the china problems then companies uh, private companies will have hard time uh, we need more uh, transparent you know kind of uh, uh, guiding guiding principles even though you don't have to expose to the public i mean you can through the government this is the reason why we have to do this so if you make uh, if you persuade or make uh, private companies understand, then uh, they will make uh, their own adjustment. Uh, the government cannot do, uh, provide any direction for them to, you know, to do what, you know, to do, to do, to do, to do this or to do what. But uh, I think, uh, uh, and also cooperation, we, we mentioned cooperation, is it be between the government or is it, is it between uh, uh, private sectors? We have to be very clear on, on this to promote, you know, the cooperation among major firms in both countries the government should provide the right environment rather than you know directly engage if the government is directly engaging we are not different from china so i think we have to be careful in in providing some some directions uh, to the private companies i will stop here thank you and, and dr lee let me just get your take on that issue as well on the 5g issue and and just the perspective of where we might be on this, not just in a year from now in either administration, as you said, but in five years from now, what are these emerging technologies alongside 5G that are gonna shape the contours of this conversation in the coming decade? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Korea-US cooperation uh, in terms of 5G, 5G network, I think, uh, Korea is already cooperating on that issue. Uh, as is well known, uh, the two Korean companies, uh, particularly telecom service companies like KT and SKT, are included in the uh, State Department's uh, trusted telcos. So in that regard, I think South Korea is already cooperating with the uh, uh, State Department's uh, 5G net, uh, clean network initiative. But at the same time, uh, of course, uh, there is another third company in Korea that actually uses uh, Huawei's 5G networks, but uh, that company's market share in Korea is just about 20%, less than 20% actually. The, that means that the majority of the Korean market will be serviced by the trusted telcos in Korea. So in that regard, I think the Korea already is uh, cooperating with the uh, US uh, 5G clean network initiative. At the same time, I think uh, we should approach this issue in terms of the, the decoupling. Actually, 
uh, decoupling has been uh, uh, going on for the last couple of decades in, in this region. Uh, it is part of the, of course, the U.S. Ep efforts to incorporate geopolitical considerations into the changes in supply chains. At the same time, it was a part of the uh, China's attempt to uh, increase its own uh, technological uh, capabilities as well as the uh, uh, reduce uh, technological dependence on foreign countries. So in that regard, I think to some extent or ironically, both the United States and China have a common interest in reducing the level of interdependence between the two, comp uh, two countries. So th uh, this is the kind of the uh, example of the, like, uh, the, the geopolitic geopolitical considerations are tightly incorporated into the issues related to issues related to decoupling uh, in. Um, uh, particularly in high tech areas, but at the same time, the point, another point I would like to make is that the uh, decoupling uh, issue has to do with the structural reformulation of the supply chains in uh, in, in East Asia. Actually, uh, for the last couple of decades, actually structural changes in supply chains have been made uh, in terms of the. Uh, uh, the China emerged as a uh, supply hub in the regional value chains, and uh, at, as a result, China actually uh, has become a kind of the uh, has created the hierarchical nature of the supply chains in East Asia. At the same time, the trade linkages between Asia and North America has become quite weakened. That is the kind of the structural changes of the supply chain. So in that regard, I think the decoupling issue is a combination of the geopolitical uh, consideration as well as, as the uh, structural uh, change in the uh, supply chains. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, and I want to get into that supply chain issue. But before we do, uh, Bob, I, I want to turn to you briefly on an issue that we focus on at the Geoeconomic Center, which is the reform of the Bretton Woods institutions. And the Republic of Korea didn't exist in 1944 when the IMF and the World Bank were created. So too is of the majority of current IMF and World Bank members. And I wonder now, as we think about reforming and rebuilding the global economic system and the rise of China, you know, what is the kind of thing that allies like the US and Korea could do together in a new Bretton Woods and a Bretton Woods reform process to recognize the changing nature of the global economy. And Dr. Lee brought up supply chains and we've talked about 5G, all the things that they could not have imagined in 1944. Where is the room for partnership and what would those reforms look like in your mind? Okay, um, this is a, a critical question. Um, the um, the international economic order, particularly the, the trade order, the WTO system, needs to evolve. It has, in fact, evolved over the time. And it's been a great benefit to countries who weren't present at the founding in 1944 and 1945. So for me, it's the question of what do you want to change and how do you go about doing it? Uh, for the United States, WTO reform means reforming the dispute settlement system. It also means dealing with issues that either aren't covered very well or not covered at all by WTO rules. Uh, industrial policy, domestic subsidy, technology acquisition policy. Uh, for other countries, for uh, Korea, uh, for developing countries broadly, um, the critical issues are, um, first, how to reestablish norms and rules that get enforced. The Trump administration has shown that the United States can raise tariffs on whatever it wants on national security grounds and get away with it. Um, in a world like this, the only entities that matter are the United States, the EU, China, and possibly Japan. So the reestablishment of rules is a critical uh, issue for, for Korea, for, for all the other members of the WTO. Um, second thing is some constraint on the use of the national security. 
exemption for um, for taking trade action. Um, the third thing I think is um, dealing with issues that have never been adequately dealt with by many of the members of the WTO, uh, in particular agricultural and commodity subsidy. And one could see a negotiation linking subsidies broadly, industrial, agricultural, commodity. It would be a big lift for the United States and for the EU, but they're, they're critical things. They're extremely important things involved all around. Excellent. Thanks, Bob. No, I think that's such an important point on the subsidy reform and hopefully the blueprint uh, for reform of all of these systems, um, IMF, World Bank, WTO going forward. Hopefully this is a moment allies can cooperate on that kind of project. Uh, so I want to turn back to the supply chains issue that Dr. Lee raised me on, and, and I want to Bring this to you. You know, we've heard a lot in the U.S. over the past six months since the onset of this crisis about diversifying supply chains, reshoring, how this is going to remake the global trade system. I, I think the reality, as we would recognize, is there's been a little less movement from the private sector on that front. So I'm wondering your perspective on what's realistic in terms of diversifying and changing global supply chains. A lot of these have been built up over decades. What are you seeing actually happening? What might we expect in the year ahead? Thank you, Josh. And I completely agree with you. Suddenly, since COVID-19, we hear so much in Washington, D.C. Um, about the discussion of the how to realign um, the global supply chains, which is a long term project with, um, with, with a lot of high um, capital expenditure up front. Um, and, and it's not clear to see whether the reshoring is going to happen um, short term or not, as you just laid out. And I just wanted to start with um, uh, the, the comment that I don't think COVID-19 um, itself alone has changed firms' views and strategy. Some some scholars and experts um, like tend to argue, but really COVID-19 combined with trade war, um, wars in the U.S., China trade tensions, and the underlying um, skepticism about the globalization and new technological advancements that we talked about and that have changed the conception of national security, that, that all um, affected firms' views and vulnerability with regard to the global supply chains. And um, as you pointed out, I think it is important to examine how companies are reacting differently um, to supply chain disruptions due to COVID-19 and US-China decoupling. And also that is a point that Minister Park also mentioned uh, um, earlier. And some studies like Kearney um, mentioned that uh, argue that global manufacturing is moving away from China and the US technology industry seems to remain the most vulnerable due to potential decoupling um, because it is so, our US is so dependent on the technological industry, is so dependent on supply chains in China in terms of revenue exposure. In contrast, um, there are few firms that are willing to entirely give up on um, production on China, particularly if they sell to Chinese domestic market. And according to um, May 2020 joint survey um, by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, Beijing and PwC, 70 percent of U.S. firms operating in China have no plan to move their production and supply chains out of China. And one example uh, would be um, Apple, um, um, some of the firms that are not only going to stay in China, but even um, deepen their presence. And, and one example would be Chinese company Lockshare has acquired its uh, first Apple assembly plant. Um, and um, in terms of the Asian countries, also we see a lot of different array of re reactions in terms of the supply chain disruptions in Japan and Ch China have been, J uh, Japan and Taiwan um, have been in, in the forefront um, in terms of supporting the US government, US government effort to reorganize the strategic supply chains to bypass China. And um, there are also countries like India, Vietnam, and Indonesia that are likely benefiting from the U.S.-China trade war um, to attract companies that are planning to leave China. And um, for example, India is developing an area um, of land bigger than Long Island to attract business moving out of China with $6.6 .6 billion of financial incentive. And obviously for Korea, how and whether firms are going to join such effort is much more challenging and complicated than other countries based on the infrastructure of the industries. 
And I would say that each industry and each company country has different interests and motivations with regard to national security calculations and business risk when doing business with China. And doing business with China is not just about making things in China, but also about selling things in China. And so far, a rising Chinese production cost in US-China trade dispute have led supply chains to relocate to other low cost manufacturing hubs like Vietnam and Mexico rather than moving to the United States. So again, whether and to what extent the COVID and US-China decoupling will catalyze reshoring is unclear. And, um, and I'd like to stop here because I would also like to hear um, views from other speakers. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mian. And so we only have a, a few minutes left, uh, about four minutes left. So, and we didn't even get to so many issues. I, I wanted to bring up BTS and the K-pop issue that happened with China, uh, but we didn't have time to get to it. So perhaps for another session. Um, so Minister Park, let me end, end with you and give you the final word here. Um, one responding to what Mian had said, and then maybe broadly to end on an optimistic note, hopefully, you know, what, what have you seen coming out of this COVID crisis that creates room for more collaboration between South Korea and the United States, whether it's on health issues, trade issues, it doesn't have to be strictly limited to the economics, but hopefully you can uh, leave us with some inspiration today. Well, uh, I would like to end uh, uh, this presentation, uh, this session, by saying that uh, COVID-19 is a very important issue, but uh, it could be overcome if we uh, develop a vaccine or treatment or medicine or those kinds of things as time goes by. But more important thing is uh, about the, you know, the trade uh, uh, regime, trade governance in the future. So we talk about, uh, you know, reforming the WTO, which is very important, but it's very outdated because it has a fundamental flaw. Uh, if you look at this uh, right now, because decision making requires consensus among 164 members. So it hardly make any decision. So it just, you know, this, this decision-making mechanism have, have been abused for doing nothing for the last 20 years. So I think uh, uh, in dealing with China, we, we have to start with uh, uh, reforming the WTO. Uh, I think uh, we have to allow uh, only a handful number of uh, members can, can do something which is not allowed because of consensus kind of mechanism uh, at the moment. So we have to be more flexible, uh, even within the WTO members. Uh, that's what we call the plurilateral trade agreements among uh, like-minded countries. On top of that, uh, if I need the leadership uh, from the United States, maybe TPP or Economic uh, Prosperity Network under the Trump administration, which means that uh, they will form a regional, very high standard regional trade agreements, uh, which is open. So maybe China can can be a member too in the in, in the in the in the you know in the future. In other words, the final ultimate goal in dealing with China is not marginalizing or excluding China, but we have to make them open up more and also adopt the more transparent global rules of trade or commercial rules within China, this is our ultimate goal, then we have to, uh, uh, you know, mobilize all the possible approaches, multilateral, uh, it has some limitations, but uh, we have to also have uh, 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 regional uh, approaches like TPP or uh, EPN, uh, or, you know, bilaterally, uh, as uh, Trump has been doing uh, so far. I mean, with all, with all kind of this, this kind of uh, approaches, we can change uh, the future global trade environment. This is my you know, hope and uh, this is my ending note uh, for this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's the perfect note to end on. And I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists for their insights. I feel more optimistic about the future of the U.S.-South Korea Economic Partnership than I did before. And I hope we can continue these kind of conversations because I think this can form the foundation for strengthening the partnership in the years to come. So allow me now to turn it over to my colleague, Barry Prevell, Senior Vice President of the Atlantic Council and Director of the Scowcroft Center to give concluding remarks for today's conference. 
Thank you so much, Josh and, and panelists. And as we conclude today's strategic dialogue, I just want to thank all of you again, all of our distinguished guests for what was really an interesting and frank discussion on the future of the alliance and the economic partnership. Given the rapidly changing geopolitical landscape uh, broadly, but also in the Indo-Pacific, as well as next week's presidential election, it is difficult to think of a more important time to be having this exact kind of dialogue. I wanted to extend a special thanks to our colleagues at the East Asia Foundation, Minister Kim, Dr. Moon, and the foundation team for co-hosting this event with us again and for their tireless effort to help convene this dialogue virtually during a global pandemic. Um, I look forward to when we can co-host together again in person. Today's discussions are part of a broader effort by the Scowcroft Center and our Asia Security Initiative to develop strategies for helping the US and its allies and partners meet the most pressing challenges of the COVID era. To that end, I wanted to highlight three upcoming Scowcroft Center reports by the Asia Security Initiative that will definitely build upon today's dialogue. First report will provide a roadmap for the future of the Alliance and the economic partnership directly keying off of today's discussion. The second one will go into great detail on the question of how to best coordinate South Korea's regional engagement policy in Southeast Asia, the new Southern policy, with the US's own regional engagement efforts under the US Indo-Pacific strategy. And then finally, the third report will assess the continually evolving critical challenge of global supply chain security with a focus on prospects for US-Korea cooperation. Please stay tuned for these reports, which will be released in the next few weeks. The US and the Republic of Korea have managed to overcome an exceptional range of security and economic challenges for almost seven decades now. And I'm very confident that the two countries will be able to meet challenges together for years to come based on our shared values. We at the Atlanta Council believe that the United States cannot maintain peace and stability and a rules-based order without the closest cooperation with allies and with friends. And therefore, we actively seek to promote constructive engagement around the world. And today's dialogue most certainly served this mission well. Again, thank you all of our distinguished guests for the rigorous discussion and to our audience members for tuning in. Take care and have a good rest of your evening or day. Thank you very much.